I said Film Pond come to you live every Monday and Thursday. Usually I do a show a little bit earlier today. Monday shows on relationships, Thursday shows on politics. Today we're going to talk a little bit about AI, agenda, and relationships. And let me just get right into it. AI is now being funded by the government, and universities all over this wide land are getting deluged with money as long as they can tie it in some way to artificial intelligence. So the problem is going to be that so many people are going to get jobs and overwhelm these departments based on their supposed expertise in artificial intelligence, but they're going to be hacks. Insofar as the deeper questions about artificial intelligence, and so they're going to screw up, especially if you hire them in the humanities, they're going to screw up the, the, the shape of the department in a way that I think is unbecoming for the kinds of justice issues I care about. And I, tell, and I say this because I saw it screw up the social sciences and biology, even the natural sciences. Um, before it was AI, it was just coding, right? So about 15 years ago, computer programming took over a lot of our natural sciences and even social sciences where you could get a biology PhD even and never even touch a microscope. You can get a biology PhD, never touch a microscope, but you couldn't get one if you uh, couldn't code, right? So I think it was tied to the genome, but for some reason, uh, computer programming became the thing and all sciences were reduced to computer programming. The problem is that it then narrowed the discipline so that questions that couldn't be answered by computer modeling and statistical modeling then got seen as non-scientific questions, right? And, you know, the United States has a lot of problems that can't be fed, that can't be programmed their way out. And, like, there's no mass data that will fix it, right? Like, the wars we get into and our, our justice issues and how to... Um, you know, realize subjective and objective freedom in the world and the institutions we need to, to realize them. It's not a matter of, of data crunching, necessarily. So um, it turns out that when all of this money went into computer, all of this emphasis and energy went into computer programmers, we hired a bunch of computer programmers in, in the biological and natural sciences, they weren't asking other questions because they weren't equipped to it, because it showed their irrelevance. Now, I'm scared about AI experts taking over humanities departments, and especially philosophy departments, because I have a special affinity for philosophy departments. I'm scared of them taking over those departments and then narrowing the kinds of questions to the kinds of questions that can be answered by artificial intelligence. You know, 30 years ago, we saw this with the Scantron test of uh, taking over public education, and then narrowing the scope of public education to what can be addressed on a Scantron test. And it's just going to be easy, and I think it's unfortunate that that's the case. And I'm just warning you now that we let in, you got to let the right one in, like vampires. You let in AI um, hacks, and then you're going to be surprised when they have to screw up your entire discipline just to stay relevant for themselves as hacks. Now, what does this have to do with gender? This is where it's going to get a little bit um, uh, controversial. And I'll tell you right now, you should go over to www.funkyacademic.com and kick in $5, $15, and $50 because nobody's going to give you the quality of wisdom uh, that I offer for free. Well, regularly regular. Um, <laughs> someone says better late than never. Yeah, well, I'm here. Yeah, I got to put the kids to bed and hopped in the shower and came back and now I'm, I'm here and I'm doing my doing my duty for the people. So now, let's. what does this have to do with gender? Well, we're in a bit of a pickle in, in the United States because the United States, like me, wants women everywhere. I, want, I expect women to be in all levels of society. I think they should be in all levels of access of power. And I think it's unfortunate that they were ever locked out of any of those um, aisles of power and, and, and weren't allowed to touch some of those levers. I, I want them everywhere. The problem is we can't do that and, buy, and be naive about what gender is meant up until now in the United States. And what gender is meant in, in, to, in the United States, especially among the whites, is that we needed eternal victims in order to have eternal um, uh, uh, protectors who then would 
protect the victims from the predatory classes, you know, out groups, um, black people, sometimes Asian, sometimes Latin American, and, and all the time men, right? So we needed someone to be protected. So pretty much we raised generations upon generations of, of white women who understood their gender identity as being a little bit useless and always being victims and not being particularly responsible for anything because they had to be victims. So they couldn't be responsible for anything because if they were responsible for anything, they might be actually seen as perpetrators and active. So they had to be passive victims. Um, and we tied that to their gender identity. The problem is when you put those people into positions of power, um, it's hard. You can't keep them accountable for anything. So they end up screwing up the entire edifice. For example, public education is a great ex example of this. White women are the, the, the face and thrust of, of public education, and that's the reason why we can't hold teachers accountable for teaching anything, because it would involve making them feel bad. <laughs> and we're not up to that. And so it screws up the entire, the entire, um, the entire industry. So now you have to be very suspicious of any industry, including you know mental health or wherever, where, the, where there's a you know deluge of white women, um, because not because they shouldn't be there, but because we haven't done the work we have we need to do on American womanhood to make it less of you know, <laughs> Barbie or whatever, right? So uh, the idea is that women should be everywhere men are, but we need to reconstruct womanhood to make them responsible. Like we need to, and I'm one of these guys who say like conventional white manhood's a problem and conventional white womanhood is a problem. You don't fix conventional white manhood by inserting conventional womanhood in positions of power. What that does is end up being a, a, a power grab for the whites, Um and I do racialize gender because I think gender is racialized and classed. And what we consider our gender identities are often class identities and gender aspirations are often class aspiration. Anybody who wants to be treated like a lady isn't trying to like, you know, I don't know, work a job, <laughs> like work a working class job. All right, so there's something, um, there's already a class embedded in our gender identities in ways that we don't talk about a real man um, um, so, so we need to talk about how we insert women into all aspects of society and, um, but without changing, like without reconceiving womanhood. So it ends up inserting a lot of kind of bad and irresponsible and unaccountable entitlements into all aspects of society, which isn't particularly good for anyone. Uh, David Diggin, uh, Diggin says that if we don't have an opportunity to participate in production, that we will have a class of people cut out of the dignity and economic, of economic participation. He is absolutely right. You are right. He's, this, is, this is right. Um, I'm not one of these guys who believes that America should be free or that Democrat or, or participation in civil society is, is optional. I think everyone should participate in civil society. Everyone's got to work. Everyone's got to work. Everyone should work in a, um, in a civil society that works for everyone, right? Like, I want health care. That means I want people to service me as a person when I get sick, but I should have to do something for them. <laughs> um, and that's why we have, like, a complex market economy. So I'm, I'm very pro-federal job guarantee. I think everyone needs to be able to work and be fitted into uh, society. And our, we should be putting quite a bit of political energy into making sure that everyone has a productive role in the economy. And there's a lot of work that doesn't get, there's enough deferred maintenance in uh, the South to keep people working for 200 years. I was just in New Orleans, and I love New Orleans as a town, but man, what a federal job guarantee would do to New Orleans to, put, to, to keep it clean and, um, and, you know, all the tucks pointed on the buildings. And it would just be a beautiful city all the time as opposed to one that needs you know, whole areas that need just, they, they just have deferred maintenance. And, and so just imagine if you had, if you had Disneyland level janitorial staff 
for New Orleans. What a what a tourist destination it would be, and because it would be able to keep clean and nice. Um, you know, even when the people are pissing in the streets, it would get cleaned up the next day by someone on a federal job guarantee. So federal job guarantee, twenty five dollars an hour. Anyone who wants to work in America should be able to just sign up to the employment office where they just get employed. Um, yeah, we can put in national infrastructure projects, including roads, schools, hospitals. Like, I think people, under, people assume that all the work, that the market takes care of all the work that needs to be done. But that's just not true. We could do wellness visits. Right now, people are just dying in their home alone and, because nobody checked in on them in, in, in two weeks. We could do wellness visits and uh, you know pay people to go play with old people i'm fine with that too um i i i think i think that's great i think that's part of healthcare i would i would support all of that i would support all of that um but i do think people need to f work for society for, in order for society to work for them and cuz i i uh, so yeah Another thing that, you know, 40 years of feminism hasn't really improved besides our labor and relation, uh, our, besides not improving our labor or racial politics, it hasn't really improved these issues because white women don't deal with it. They've always had a, they haven't always had, but they currently have a gender identity or the struggle that was born out of a work optional life. They wanted the option to work and be economically productive and responsible. Um, and so, like, labor politics isn't the um, isn't like in the forefront of their mind. The, you know, it's hard. Have you? <laughs> it's hard to talk to white women about a federal job guarantee because they don't understand work. <laughs> right? They don't understand work because they're like of a certain class. They're of the class of people like who watch their moms not work, or have work optional lives. Right. So. Um, so I, I'm a huge fan of women participating in all aspects of society, but we need to be honest about, we need to be honest about how we need to reconstruct womanhood so that it's a gender identity that actually welcomes accountability as opposed to one that was constructed to, um, uh, deflect accountability because we needed we needed an eternal victim in order to, to keep the race game going. That's why in states that take racism, like that have a racial problem, you'll find very kind of dubious gender identities and like gender commitments, right? Because a lot of our gender is about class and race in ways that we don't understand. So you can't just send in unreconstructed women into um, all aspects of respectable and responsible society because they'll screw up those aspects of respectable and responsible society. And, like, so, and I say this as a man who's not a fan of conventional manhood. I'm also not a convention, ma fan of conventional womanhood, and I don't think you, conv you fix conventional manhood by just like shooting up conventional women in, 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 into those spaces because um, it took a long time for, it took a long time for men to figure out how to be hard and responsible. Um, and we can't just assume that, you know, women are there. So we just work on the identity. We just work on, work on the gender. We talk about gender and we talk about how this is working out. And why, how this came to my mind is going to be the show on Thursday. On show on Thursdays is going to be the, the polite Zionism of, I hate BB Netanyahu, but I think Israel should be a state. Well, if you think Israel should be a... And I, I hate Bibi Netanyahu, but I think Israel should be a Jewish state. That's ridiculous. You don't get your Jewish state without a Bibi Netanyahu because you need a Bibi Netanyahu um, to sustain, to be the bad man who secures your Jewish state, your ethno state, in the middle of people who don't want a Jewish ethno state. Right? You need a bad man. And the reason you don't know that is because you're irresponsible. <laughs> the people who are responsible, they, they know that. So they'll say that, like, well, you don't get a Jewish state. Um, and they'll be honest. Because before it was Bibi Netanyahu, you know what? It was Ariel Sharon. And before it was Ariel Sharon, it was Rabin mowing down protesters. Right? Because you need a bad man. 
And this actually reminded me of the scene from um, A Few Good Men where um, Jack Nicholson admits that he ordered the code red and he give, goes on this nice speech where he's like, you know, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall so you can have your nice little cushy life. So a lot of these people want Bibi Netanyahu on the wall and they need him on the wall, but then they pretend like they don't, right? So if you want your nice little Jewish state, you're going to have to deal with the Netanyahu's. The problem is you want your nice little Jewish state, but you don't want to have to deal with the Netanyahu's. And that, I think, is a quality of polite Zionism that's, that's a feminization of politics. And I'll say that. You want the nice things, but you are not, you don't want to admit that there's dirty work involved in keeping those nice things. Whereas I, and I get to be the bad guy who says, like, you don't get to have nice things because the dirty work's immoral. You don't yet your Jewish state. You don't get your Jewish ethno state. And if you don't and if you have a problem with that, it's a you problem. You want a fantasy. By the way, the two-state solution is a fantasy. It's it's like it's like listening to leftists talk about a general strike in America. No, it's not gonna happen. It's a fantasy. A two-state solution is apartheid. So that is what it is. I hope I uh, clarified a lot of issues. You can't insert shoehorn in a lot of unreconstructed identities and assume that they'll fix the problem because those identities were formed under the problem. So just like shoehorning in women in all aspects of society will not fix our gender problems because the quality, especially in the United States, the quality of, of class and racial politics and labor politics that was associated with womanhood like isn't particularly progressive or good. We haven't had a lot of revolutions. We haven't had a lot of like big movements, successful, like powerful, aggressive movements um, led by women, which I think is unfortunate, but we need to be honest about like what is it going to take to radicalize that gender um, because it's an issue, because it's an issue. And I want them in all levels and axes of power. I just don't want them to suck the energy and de-radicalize and neuter and throw to 501c3s and give excuses and, 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 and suck out any mechanism of accountability for all levels of power and responsibility. So on Thursday, I'm going to talk more. I'm going to go deep into polite Zionism as opposed to hardline Zionism. Because I think polite Zionism is actually like normie Zionism of, I hate Bibi Netanyahu and I want a two-state solution and I think Israel should be a Jewish state. You don't get those three things all together. You just don't, and, it's, and the fact that you think you do, I think means you're naive about what it means to run a, like, to, to, to have to secure a state against people who really want their land back, Right? If you want from C to signing C in America, that means you're going to get an Andrew Jackson. That's what it took. So we need to be honest about that. And, and if you don't want an Andrew Jackson and you don't want a genocide, then you need to be more modest in your gains, in your, in your aspirations. Um, oh, okay, so someone's asking, what am I? All right, Medicare, Medicare for all. Yeah, I... I don't have a problem with... Someone's asking my opinion on all these issues. I can rattle them off. I don't have a problem with Medicare for all as long as it comes with a federal job guarantee. I don't want loafers. I don't want people who think that America is free because Medicare for all means other people are working on you. And if you're working and other people are working on you, they should expect you also to work for the society that's working for you. Right? So I'd, I'd, want, I'd want a scheme where it's okay if we tie uh, health care to um, a job, but... We need a federal job guarantee. We can't just allow the private market to take care of the to uh, to to deal with the most um, vulnerable of our population, right? We need a federal job guarantee. Good, everyone gets a good unionized unionized job starting at twenty five dollars an hour if you want to work, right? And if you work, you get health care and all that stuff. So, I think that handles uh, Medicare for all. Tuition, yeah, sure. De um, College tuition, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I do think we should cancel all student debt because there was a generation of people who, who sold a bill of goods on college debt, and it's strangling them, and it's not really 
good for them. And yeah, free, uh, debt free public education, debt free advanced vocational training, cash payments for reparations for ADLs. Yeah, I'm I'm for cash payments. I also want institutional um, power, right? Because I'm worried about cash payments just being sucked up if we don't have institution if we're not on boards and we and we don't actually run like power companies so i need like whole assets and institutional assets being transferred over to um uh whole assets being transferred over to uh to to black people and black institutions i mean we should just endow the everything that everything black <laughs> endow everything black and we need like like i said power companies big farms like we need massive transfer of assets and preferential contracts to build assets and we can't just take over john deere then like we need to take over john deere's contracts um and let john deere you know fend for itself and carrier and all that stuff uh what do i say about yellen saying that we can support israel and ukraine well so the jetty the national debt is what we think is isn't what we think it is we we print money and so we need to worry about inflation and making bombs to bomb other people um um making bombs to bomb other people doesn't really add to inflation unless you're in seattle <laughs> the home of boeing I think Boeing's based in Seattle. But so, um, so it, it's not obvious that uh, printing money to pay for more bombs will add to inflation. So I, I, I think we can pay for it. But should we pay for it? I don't think we should. I, I don't think we should. I, 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 Ukraine, I don't think, should exist in its, its state. It was a kleptocracy up until like five minutes ago, and now it's an authoritarian state because they just banned all of their political parties and consolidated the media. And they upped the draft age to something ungodly like 50 or 45. So it's just not a state that can sustain itself as a state. And if I'm Russia and if I'm Putin and all I have to do is convince Russians that, that um, the Americans want to turn uh, the Ukraine into a proxy and a staging ground for a future invasion and incursion of Russian sovereignty, that's the easiest argument in the world. So... I've never been a fan of the Ukraine war. I think we should have pushed for um, uh, a surrender early before all the bodies started piling up. And then Ukraine becomes like Belarus. Because the argument is too easy to make to, for the Russian people that it's going to be a U.S. Proc, a US uh, satellite. Especially when they were flirting with NATO entry. Like, we, we blew it. We blew it. And so what about in Israel? I'm just, I think we should condition all aid on Israel and Israel becoming more and more secular. But the Israelis want a Jewish state. So I don't believe in ethno states. If they were an ethno state before and it was uncontested, I'd be like, fine, but I'm not going to pay for your defense against an internal minority. Now it's a contested ethno state and I'm just not going to. Um, uh, I, I'm just not going to support, I don't think you can have a democratic ethno state because what if you don't want to be a part of that ethnicity? What if you choose out of the religion? Do you, you lose your political power too and your power in civil society. So I am not, uh, yeah, I'm not going to support a war in defense of an ethno state. I think we should have fewer ethno states. Um, but I, I might talk about more on that on Thursday. Uh, yes, I support reparations, obviously, because I, I think black people need to be made whole. The damage done to black institutions, I, it's, it's, it's gotten in the water table. It's it, like they're not reproducing very well. <laughs> like it, it doesn't get better in a few generations for black people in, in America without reparations. Um, it might get better for like a handful of black families, but in general, no, no, it's it, it's not getting brighter. Uh, okay, so I guess someone asked me my thoughts about abortion. I don't like that the Democrats are running on abortion, and that's their only issue because it makes white women feel relevant. 
And when you put a bunch of white women in power, they don't care about racial or labor politics, but they'll care about abortion. So all talk will be about abortion with the idea that, well, you know, you'll elect uh, Democrats based on abortion. And once they get in, they'll fight for racial and labor justice. No, they won't. No, they won't. Um, because they don't care about that stuff. It doesn't touch them. Their life has been... <laughs> They want easy virtue. Like they're, 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 they're not about that life. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think you get racial and labor justice talking about things that aren't racial and labor justice. And abortion is not racial and labor justice. And so I, uh, so I don't like the Democrats winning and running on abortion, even if it wins. Like, I'd, honestly, I I'd, I'd live in Georgia right now. I've made my peace with Republican rule. Um, it's either living in Georgia or living in... Actually, I'm very happy I pandemic in Georgia as opposed to California. And I'm from California because California shut down more things and Georgia stayed, ho stayed open. So. so there you go. Um, when people stay at home and receive stimulus in 2020, the environment started to repair itself. What would a job guarantee do to the environment? I... I think it would get things cleaner. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 There you go. Oh, and the firms, uh, in terms of starting your own business, look, I want to pay a federal job guarantee that's big enough, that pays well enough that you could um, quit the job when you save up and start your own business. And then when it fails, you can go back to uh, work at a good job. And so there you go. That's how I feel about that. Thank you for your time. I'll see you Thursday where I'm going to talk about the polite Zionism of, I like Bibi Netanyahu. I mean, I hate Bibi Netanyahu, but I like the idea of a Jewish ethno state without being honest about the fact that you need a Bibi Netanyahu if you want your Jewish ethno state and how we need to change these people so that they're no longer polite Zionists. Peace.